uh, that time of prayer, uh, that sweet hour of prayer, is the time where I can have true thanksgiving and enjoy true peace. See, if we can enjoy thanksgiving and peace through my prayer, then that leads to renewal for me. It renews my mind and my heart, my body, my soul. It changes the way I see things and the way I see people and I, the way I see my problems and my situation because all of that in thanksgiving, all of that in peace becomes my answer then. Because there isn't a world, there isn't a human life that isn't without problems and without conflicts and without meeting people. But all of this becomes my answer when I enjoy thanksgiving and peace through this true hour of prayer. Uh, today, we're going to begin, uh, we're going to continue our gospel letter meeting, but we're going to begin our fifth meeting today, which is, <clears throat> why don't I have assurance? Uh, we know from our previous meetings why people aren't happy, why people cannot meet God. We know what is the only answer for this. But there are times when I find myself not having this assurance. I know the gospel. I love the gospel. I believe in God's word. But yet there are times where I find myself in a Genesis chapter 3, a Genesis chapter 6, a Genesis chapter 11 situation. When I find myself in that place, it's because of a lack of assurance that I may be facing from time to time. But then if God is giving us this word, if he's allowing us to hear at this time his word, then it's because we have received salvation. And at this time, we can restore that assurance that can only be found when we have this time of true worship. Because even this small meeting is our worship unto God. So why don't I have assurance? The first is that it is because I do not know about the life of the saved. Because the saved children of God live a completely separate life. They have a completely different life from everyone else. And this life is very, very blessed because it is the only life that can actually ever know and believe and enjoy the things that God has given, that God has prepared. At my workplace two days ago, there is this uh, young lady, and she's Muslim, and I overheard her because she talks very loud also, but she, was, she sits near to me, and she also talks very loud. But she was discussing with another young man her religion. She said, I'm, I'm Muslim. And she kept saying over and over and over again, my religion says I can't do this. My reli I, I'm not even making, she said that, my religion, my religion, my religion. And the only thing I could think during her whole, her, her whole explanation is, what a hard life. That must be such a hard life. I can't do this. I can't do this. And, I, and at the end of it, at the end of her saying, oh, it's because of, I can't do this, I can't do this, she said, at the end, she didn't even have a reason. There was no reason for all this at the end. I, I just, and I want to ask, I just want to get up from my cubicle and be like, so what's the point then? <laughs> I want to ask her, what's the point of all this? What, what's the point of you being Muslim if, what's the point of that life? that you can't do anything. Uh, I'm not criticizing, I'm not judging her because she's Islam or she's Muslim. I'm just saying that for us, the saved children of God, we have a reason to exist. We have a reason to live. It's this life of the saved that we, can, we are allowed to enjoy, that we have been blessed to enjoy. And in that meeting and in all the things that we hear, all the things that we see, we can continuously confirm that word of God. Because Jesus Christ himself said to us, blessed are your ears for you can hear. And blessed are your hearts that you can believe. Those are his words to us. Number one says this, a saved person is one who has surely accepted Jesus and confessed it with his heart, mind, 
and mouth. Everyone, anyone can say the words Jesus Christ. People use that as a swear often. I even hear Christians using it as like a swear. Oh, Jesus Christ. Like, oh, and I hate it. I really, I'm sorry. There's, there are very few things I hate in this world, but those were, that's one of the things I really hate. I hate hearing people say his name like that. That you would take the only name that could bring you salvation. You would take the only name that can completely destroy and bring Satan to his knees, and you would use it like that. It always, it always, <laughs> it always kind of bugs me a little bit. And I, it really bugs me when Christians use it like that. And that happens often. But what does it mean that I can confess this? Because anyone can say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. But what does it mean that I can confess it with my heart, my mind, and my mouth? What does the Bible say? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. This is, I mean, this is what it means to confess that Jesus is Christ, that we believe that in our hearts as we make the confession from our mouths, that we confess Jesus is Lord. First John chapter four verse fifteen. First John chapter four verse fifteen says, "Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God." Amen. Everyone, I bless you all in the name of this our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would make the same confession every day. For a saved person, only the saved person can make this confession. But this confession isn't such a small thing. Because when we make this confession that Jesus is Christ, great spiritual works take place. This isn't just a confession that we have to show in front of people, because we really don't. It's not something I say just to, sound, just to make sure everyone knows I'm a Christian, because no one needs to know that. This is a confession we make that completely resolves all the problems, all the sin, all the Satan and curses, and the destiny of hell in my life. This is the name, this is the confession we can enjoy in the life of the saved. And this is a confession that I enjoy every single day. And even in the smallest things, and even in the biggest crisis, I'm able to make this confession that Jesus is Christ. And it gives me a peace that no one else can give me. There's no person in this world that can give me peace like Jesus can. My wife, my children, my son, my co anybody else that I know cannot give me this peace. Only Christ Jesus gives me this peace. There is no amount of money or worldly comfort that actually gives me peace except for the name that Jesus is Christ. I experienced this even in the smallest things. Even the other morning, uh, my son, he's right here. He's like messing around. You can't see him. But he was kicking me in my face and my neck the other morning, and I woke up. And I was very stressed about it because it was 2.30 in the morning. I wake up at 5 a.m., and so I, and I start my day, and I have to pr do my prayers and go to work. And so when I get woken up in the middle of the night, it really bothers me. It stresses me out because I know I have to be up soon. He's like kicking me awake, and then he wakes up my wife, and she starts getting up and starts cleaning the house at 5 a.m. I was like, what are you, 3 a.m., like what are you doing? And I couldn't go back to sleep, and it really stressed me out, like very, very much, to the point where I almost got up to, like, have an argument. I was like, everyone go to sleep. Like, what is happening? But at that moment, I thought this, and I made this small prayer to God. I said, God, if I'm a child of God, why should this bother me? And I said, God, may the power of your throne be upon me at this time in the name of Jesus Christ. And it brought me peace that I could otherwise never experience. It brought me a kind of peace that really just put me right back to sleep. Because people love to talk about what brings them peace and happiness, but those things don't actually work. People love to talk about, oh, I do this, I, I do yoga, or I, I meditate on this, or I have money, or have this person who gives me strength and hope. Everyone, th I've had those things. I know what it's like to have a very little. I know what it's like to have a lot. And there's nothing, and I know what it's like to be with a lot of people and with no people. I know what it's like to be in comfort and in discomfort and everything in between. And I'll tell you the truth, 
that for my life, none of it ever brought me peace and happiness like the name of Jesus Christ. In the smallest things and even in the biggest things, God gives me peace. This is the life that we get to enjoy. This is the confession we are allowed to make, the confession that Jesus is Christ in every single thing, good and bad. Number two says this, the Spirit claims those who divinize Jesus as Savior regardless of their own power. This is life. What does Romans chapter 8 verse 9 say? However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. But what does it say in the beginning? That we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And so the spirit of God dwells in us. The third, our third meeting in our gospel letter was the first point of the third meeting was God is spirit. And I remember sharing that message, message with you all and how important it is that God is spirit. That God works very powerfully in the spirit because the spiritual things are far, is exceedingly more real than the things that we can see, hear, and touch. And that same Holy Spirit of God claims us. Claims us and gives us a power that's not my own. Because if we really look out in this world, what can we actually do with my own strength, with my own education, my own thoughts, with my body? What can I actually do? Even someone like Elon Musk, who's worth $300 billion, yes. That's the kind of money we can't even imagine. That's his net worth, $300 billion. Even if you have $300 billion, you can't help anybody. Who can you actually help with that? You're gonna, oh, well, you're gonna send people to Mars? You know, Satan doesn't care. He, he can go to Mars too. It's not, we have something greater than, it's the Holy Spirit of God that gives me true power. That's why even in this small meeting, it might seem small, it might seem like the same people, but this will be a great door and platform for world gospelization. Even if only two people end up remaining the, for the rest of the time, even that, God will receive all the blessings and God will receive all the glory. And that will open all the doors of evangelism. Our smallest devotion in the working of the Holy Spirit of God is world gospelization. We know the evidence of this in the Bible. Stephen, the first time he preached the gospel, he was stoned to death. The first time. And it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, that because of Stephen's persecution, because of his death, where no one believed, by the way, at that time, no one believed, they just stoned him, because of his persecution, they raised a church in Antioch. And the Antioch church, in Acts chapter 13, commissioned the first missionaries in our Christian history. And they brought Rome to its knees. And they did world gospelization. Our smallest devotion in this smallest meeting, because the Holy Spirit of God works in this place, it is the meeting for world gospelization. This is the life of the saved. This is the life you and I enjoy as the saved children of God. Because why? The state of those who do not have life, it's a life that's the same condition of Adam and Eve, a life that is corrupt and without true life because a life outside of this is a life that satan controls what does it say in john 8 44 second corinthians 4 verse 4 and first john verse 3 through 8 verse 3 and 8 chapter 3 verse 8 it says this you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him whenever he speaks a lie he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of all lies. What does it say here? You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do what he desires. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says what? Chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So it's absolutely true here in section B. Satan controls that spirit. Satan controls a spirit that does not have the Holy Spirit of God, that life. Because how could you possibly defend yourself against Satan if not for the power of the Holy Spirit of God? Because there's only one thing Satan's afraid of. 
because he's not afraid of your money and he's not afraid of your good looks and he's not afraid of your knowledge and he's not afraid of weapons guns can you get him please guns these these things cannot scare satan there's only one thing that satan's afraid of it is a name of jesus christ And if you don't have that, if we don't have the life, the Holy Spirit working in us, of course, you have no choice but to be under the control of Satan. You're, you are of your father, the devil, and your wish, your desire is to fulfill his desires. See, no peace regardless of how much I have. We know that to be true. The more you have, the more you worry. More money, more problems. We already know this. Actually, I even know a lot of unbelievers who say that when they don't have anything, like Mike Tyson, I recently saw an interview with Mike Tyson. Everyone knows Mike Tyson, right? Iron Mike Tyson, famous, one of the greatest boxers of all time. He, over his career, he made something like 160 some million dollars over his career. But then, a few years ago, we know that he was completely broke. He lost all of his fortune. And do you know what he said? I watched an interview with him recently. He said this. He said, oh, I have so much peace now because I have nothing. No one can take anything away from me now. So I've already lost it all. You can't take anything away from me. But when he said it, it didn't look convincing at all. He didn't look like he was actually at peace. He looked more like, I'm, I got nothing. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm so miserable. So whether you have a lot or they have a little, there is no peace. There's really no peace outside of this life of the saved. Because when you have nothing, but you have Christ, you have everything. And when you have everything, it doesn't even matter because you already have Christ. Because salvation, nothing can equate to salvation. Salvation doesn't have a price tag. Salvation was bought for you by the precious blood of the Lamb. No one else can do that except for Jesus Christ. So D, constant strife through success what does first timothy say about success but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment for we have brought nothing into the world so we cannot take anything out of it either and if we have food and covering with these we shall be content but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. Pang is a, like the pain, a sharp pain. But what does the Bible say about success, seeking money and loving money? It, what? it leads, it plunges men into ruin and destruction because it is a root of many kinds of evil. I'm not saying, and no one is saying, the Bible isn't saying that having money is evil. To be rich is evil. That's not what the word is saying. It means that when we long for that, when my reason to exist is to make money, when I only go to church because I feel like somehow I get a benefit from this, somehow I'll, I'll have connections and I'll make money, and even when we do it in a, in a very good way, Oh, I'm going to give my offering so I, because I, I know God will bless me. Even that is us seeking money. And the Bible is very clear. Const striving for success, seeking money, that only leads to strife. It leads to problem. It leads men to ruin and destruction and to evil. And we see this all the time. Even in our world today, parents killing their children, children killing their parents just for money people stomping on everyone just to make themselves more rich and more powerful. I remember I used to work at this place, this young lady, she would say, my brother and I, we, wor we worked there together, my brother, myself, and this young lady, and we were helping each other out to make, you know, for the sales, and she was like, oh my gosh, you guys are such good brothers, you help each other make money, and we're like, of, of course, he's my brother. She's like, I, I would never do that for my family. I'll stomp on anyone to make more money than my siblings, and I just I was shocked. I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> like, really, that's the state. This isn't made up. This, these conditions of the people who don't have life in the Holy Spirit, in the gospel, this is true. They'll step on anybody. They'll step on their own family to make money. 
They don't care. But, and we know what the Bible says about that. E, my physical self receiving the devil's control and guidance unbeknownst to me. What does Ephesians chapter 2 say? In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. According to who? The prince of the power of air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's what the Bible says. We walk according to Satan who is working in the people who are separated from God. That is my physical self receiving devil, the devil's control and guidance. And the, the truth is, people don't know this. Of course they don't know this. How could they possibly know? They have no, tr that's why whenever I see someone in the field, whether it's people that I work with or anyone on TV, I don't ever hate or judge anybody. I can only feel sorry. Oh my, they, they have no choice but to be that way. It's like, I can't be mad at my son. He has this toy, this transformer toy, and he can't make it into a car and back into a He can't do it. Like, it's too hard for him. But I can't be mad at him just because he can't. He has no capability of doing that. He's too little. Likewise, when I see people in the field and they're struggling out there and they're trying to make life work with all their ideologies, philosophies, success, hard work, money, I only feel sorry. So I'm like, they have no choice but to be this way because they don't have the life of the saved. They don't know it, and they could never enjoy it. F, in time, I develop physical illnesses. And Acts chapter 4, uh, Acts chapter 8, I'm sorry, is just an example of people who have physical illnesses because of spiritual problems. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who, were ha who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So uh, the point of this scripture is to show that some physical illnesses have a spiritual root and cause. And people do develop spiritual il physical illnesses because of their dead spiritual state. Uh, G, my heart and mind are afflicted. What do we see in the Bible? And it happened as they were going to the place of prayer, a certain slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the most high, most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And she continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. So this is just to show that people have these afflictions. Uh, and Matthew chapter 17 says this, And when they came to the multitude, a man came up to him, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. So these are just examples in the scriptures that show people whose mind and hearts are afflicted. I'm not saying this is a case for every single human being that if you're sick or you have mental problem or you have some sort of affliction, it's a devil's work. I'm not saying that 100%, but absolutely the Bible shows us there are cases where my dead spiritual state produces physical and mental illnesses. It does. Absolutely does. And what's the last thing? Going to hell the day I leave this earth. And we don't even have to read Luke chapter 16 because we already know what it says. It's a lake of sulfur, brimstone, and constant suffering. This is the life that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, which we can say doesn't even have life. But you and I, and we're going to end our meeting here today uh, on the first point. But for you and I, we do know the life of the saved. We do know it. But it can't just end with me knowing it. I bless you all in the name of Jesus Christ that today will be the start where you don't simply just know the life of the saved, but that you enjoy the life of the saved. In every problem, in every blessing, in every hardship, in every good thing, in all the small meetings and even in the greatest meetings, in all of your studies, in all of your work, that you would enjoy the life of the saved. For your life was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That means your life is most precious. And the Holy Spirit of God lives 
abides in you. I'm very thankful that you and I can enjoy this blessing and be reminded of this blessing in this small mission home meeting where God is working, transcending time and space, mobilizing his armies of angels to our size. I'm very thankful for that. This is a life not anyone can know. This is a life not anyone can believe. And this is a life especially that not anyone can enjoy, but you and I can enjoy today. And I bless you all in the name of Jesus Christ that today would be the start of that life. At this time, I'd like to open the floor for anyone who would like to say anything, share anything, or ask anything.